Welcome, everybody. This is Brock Blevins, uh, co-lead for the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group, along here with Karen Nelson. Uh, welcome again to the Ecosystem Restoration Global Initiatives and in Science and Practice webinar series. We meet monthly um, to provide insight and knowledge about ecological restoration and also to provide opportunities for networking and engagement. Um, each month we have a different speaker giving a 40-minute a presentation either on global initiative, regional updates, any sort of new initiatives or technical guidance all in the name of ecological restoration. We do this on the third Friday of every month from 12 to 1, uh, uh, UTC minus 4. And after each session, uh, we have a, a question and answer period where you have a chance to ask further follow-up questions of the presenters. This is open to all CEM and IUCN members, uh, as well as restoration enthusiasts and practitioners from around the globe. Um, the link to join is included in your Zoom registration confirmation, and that is the same link you use every month. So once you register, you're automatically ready to go for each monthly session. Um, so we'll post these on the, the Restoration IUCN webpage. Um, they're a little slower to get up as far as the process of getting those posted on the links. So what I also do is um, I include them on a YouTube playlist on a little channel that we have. And um, you'll be able to find those within a week, uh, hopefully within a couple days of each um, live presentation. And if you're interested, and if you're not already a member of the CEM um, or the Restoration Thematic Group, uh, please email us, uh, Kara or myself, and we can walk you through the process of how to do that. It's simple, it's free. Um, so today we are uh, going to receive a regional update from Consuelo Bonfield. She's the president of SIACRE, which is the Society of uh, Ecological Restoration and uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, she is very well versed in uh, restoration ecology, uh, as you can see, and I include her biography um, in the uh, announcement and flyer for the reminders for this session. Um, so I'm actually going to pass off the sharing capabilities of her screen and her presentation to Consuelo, and I can let her introduce herself. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you. And I thank the Cara and Brock for inviting me to this talk. Uh, as a president of SIACRE, I have a, a personal overview of how the uh, ecological restoration uh, area is in, in some countries of Latin America. And I also made a review of what has been published lately in order to give you a, an overview, a quick overview of how, how is it going in Latin America and the Caribbean right now. Uh, I will start this talk by giving you an overview of a study that analyzed almost, almost uh, 100 restoration programs in Latin America. And they did, they did this study in order to identify broad categories. This is the study of uh, Corpus et al, which was published this year. They analyzed 97 restoration projects in 15 countries and 11 biomes. They used that databases from Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. They also analyzed projects uh, that were funded by GEF or the Forestry Investment Program, and also uh, cases from World Resources Institute, which were uh, mostly linked to private sectors within the 20 per 20 initiative. As you can see in the maps, there are a lot of projects in Mexico, a few of them in, in Central America, a lot of them in, in, uh, in uh, Colombia and Peru. Then some projects in Brazil, and that's almost all. <laughs> there is very few in Argentina, in Bolivia, in Chile, there is something, but not 
much in Uruguay. So as, as we can see, it doesn't mean that there are no more projects on, on these other countries, but perhaps they are not uh, available uh, for to review. Well, in their, in, their, uh, in their study, they identified three different types of projects. The first one, which comprised 34% of the studies, uh, is, 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 uh, well, consists of the big, the big project. They are funded by international donors. They are, they cover large areas. They have large funding and they are usually focused on recovering biodiversity, improving ecological processes, increase local employment, and also they capture and uh, capture of carbon for, for climate change programs. Many of these studies also had payment for ecosystem services, and a third of them. They usually address drivers of degradation and also included natural and assisted regeneration, and most projects had a monitoring plan. An example, an example I will give of this, of this type of project is one in the La Candona region in Chiapas, in South Mexico, with the photos you can see. This project, this is a huge project, led by Julia Carabias, which was a former Minister of Environment and Natural Resources in Mexico. So she has the capacity and a lot of uh, contacts to get money from GEF and also from the Mexican government, uh, which pays for uh, environmental services. It, it, this, this, uh, this program has been going on for, I don't know, 10 years perhaps. And it includes land demarcation and planning, conservation and restoration. So it, it is uh, one of the large uh, restoration. It's not only restoration, but the management of natural resources and conservation, more, more broadly speaking. Then we will go to the second type of project, which is, uh, which comprises 23% of all the projects. They were, they were uh, financed by companies or private land owners, most of them. They were focused on profit, so they wanted to get money from their investment. And nature improvement is secondary. In this category, they included uh, compensation plantations. I don't know if this uh, goes on in, in many countries, but in Latin America, these are the kind of plantations that companies who cause, who cause some harm to the, to the environment should uh, do something to pay for it. So that's what we call compensation plantations. Uh, these most projects were aimed at obtaining timber or non-timber products. The degree of degradation was not often uh, assessed, and many projects did not have a, a monitoring plan or a baseline assessment. However, they did uh, not use any more uh, uh, one species uh, mono, mono planting. They use uh, mixed tree plantations and natural regeneration was not very much conceived. Well, uh, one of these projects is this uh, compensation plantation in the tropical dry, dry forest of El Quimbo, Colombia, which was made uh, by Fundación Natura Colombia for some enterprise or some company that had to pay uh, for some, 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 some ecosystem transform they had done. Then we will go to the third type, which is uh, the, the biggest one, 43%. It's uh, usually focused on improving local environmental conditions. The areas they cover are usually small. Uh, the funding is made by governments or public institutes with relatively low investment, uh, less than 
$500,000. In most projects, grazers were excluded and they tried to improve ecological processes and biodiversity. Uh, carbon capture was not an objective, nor improvement of livelihoods of communities. Some of these projects had a monitoring plan, but it usually was simple, like just uh, uh, measuring plant survival and growth. As an example, I will, I, will, I will give you these programs that are funded almost funded almost every year by the National Forestry Commission in Mexico can afford. Uh, they, they do reforestation and restoration programs as the ones you can see uh, in, in, the, in the photos. Well, uh, the problem with CONAFOR is that it acts both as a program funding for a restoration or restoration pro projects, but it also acts as a, as a as a way to fight poverty. So they pay salaries to rural, to rural people to do the work. Uh, usually very low salaries. <laughs> people <laughs> is reluctant sometimes to work with these very low salaries. Um, and this approach creates problems because many communities seek funding just to obtain the money for salaries although they are not really interested in restoring their land. So sometimes they, they, they do plant the seedlings and they take out the, the, the cows, but after a year, cows come back and they have already the money and they, don't really, they didn't really want to have a forest back in that particular piece of land. So that's something I have I have lived through, and it makes these programs uh, not a failure, but the results are not uh, very good because of this uh, dual uh, 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 I don't know the word, but this dual thing that that Conafort tries to do two things at the same time, which are not always aligned. Well, this brings us to the problem of active participation. Uh, in all of these programs, uh, active community involvement is generally low, and the involvement is usually in the form of hired local labor. So people go and, and get the money for working, but they don't have like a, a emotional or intellectual or a long view of, uh, of, uh, of uh, restoration. Uh, and then most projects take a top-down approach, not necessarily considering the, the real interests of communities, and I would say this is a huge problem. Communities were often not consulted in the planning phase, and their participation was limited to the implementation phase, I mean, to work, the paid work they were rarely involved in monitoring. Uh, I, the photo in the top is a photo of my own research, so I was trying to restore that part of what we call Barranca. Down there, down the hills, there was a river. And we, the community decided that they wanted to restore around uh, 100 hectares, which was our proposal, but they, Although they say they did, we could not get the true involvement of all workers. Uh, all of them, you can see them with their white hats. The rest of the people are my students or professors. And most of them were only interested in their salaries and they were not really engaged in land or vegetation recovery. I guess they had all of some other more urgent problems they had to solve, and they really did not care much at all. At the end, the, the project did, did not work well. So I, I wanted to stress this problem, which uh, I think is a problem for most projects in Latin America. 
and it's difficult to overcome. Well, now we will proceed to talk about the situation in three countries, which is Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. Because there is enough information about them, and I know something about it. So we'll go to Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, I will talk about two recent achievements. Uh, the one uh, on the left is a recent review of the states of restoration of terrestrial ecosystems. And the second on the right is an effort to establish to establish priority sites for restoration in Mexico, which was undertaken by CONAVIO, which is the National Commission on Biodiversity. And we thank God we have them. <laughs> in the first case, this book uh, published by C4, from Moises Mendes Toribio, uh, they, they interviewed uh, around 100 different projects, and I will only present a few of the results. In Mexico, most restoration projects are small. The area cover is usually lower than 1,000 hectares, and this comprises almost 70% of the projects. Then a few of them are between 1,000 and 10, thousand hectares and very few projects are larger than 10,000 hectares. So that's the situation here. Uh, the other result that is interesting is that most projects use government funds. The large uh, line you see here is 98%, which is a lot. Uh, uh, are uh, government based, and as you can see, the, these, black, these blue and green colors are those that have uh, little money, and the red ones are the ones that have a, a huge amount of money. So only uh, these uh, projects by the government, three of them have a good amount of money, and after the government, you have in second place, academia. Academia doesn't usually get uh, large funding. They never get to be red, at least orange. That means uh, $500,000. And then after that, we have international cooperation, uh, NGO, private investment, and community projects. We only have four community projects, which are also, which are usually done with very little money over here. And uh, we can see also that uh, uh, the in private investment is really low. So I think that's one of the problems in Mexico that we need to convince uh, uh, companies to to invest in the in ecosystem restoration. Uh, they usually take all the natural resources and they don't need they don't feel they need to pay back in any form for this. Especially considering water, for example, which is taken a lot from uh, from sodas and and beer companies, and they just go and take it off, and that's all they do. Well, then. As an example of this kind of project, uh, I give you this one of the mangrove restoration in Yucatan, Mexico, which is led by Jorge Herrera Silveira and Claudia Telfli. You can see their, one of their field sites in uh, 2010, and nine years later, uh, there's been a very nice recovery of vegetation. They got their funds from the academia, from government institutions. This is the Commission of Natural Protected Areas. This is the Forestry Commission, and then CONAVIO, which I already told you about. Then the second work I was going to talk to you about is a research that took place during two or three years and led to the to establishing priority sites for restoration in this country. It was funded by GIS 
I see, I see <laughs> my pronunciation and Conario. It was led by a former student of mine, Volke Tobon, and they, at the end, they, they made a map. This is, this is, this one uh, is mixing uh, conservation and restoration sites, uh, priority sites in Mexico. You, you can see there's a, they have published this work in conservation biology. They used to, the methods they used were based on a multi-criteria special spatial analysis that combined biological importance and factibility. For biological importance, they had already identified priority sites for conservation in Mexico. They, they have been working for a lot of years and they have much work done. And then they combined this biological importance with factibility. For example, they excluded sites used for intensive agro agriculture and li livestock raising, and they consider the degree of uh, fragmentation connectivity. So that was their, their criteria. So they ended up with this map, which you can see here. They identified that 15% of the terrestrial area of Mexico needs to be restored under this criteria. And uh, the ones in dark uh, violet or red are extreme priority sites, which you can see are all over the country except in the peninsula of uh, California. But in the center, especially on the center of Mexico, and then in Yucatan and all over the country, then high priority are in pink and medium priority are these uh, yellow ones. Uh, so at the end, they chose sites with high factibility and high biological importance. Uh, now, this is a good broad analysis that must be bro brought down to earth and rooted. Analyzing specific socioecological conditions that are conducive to a successful restoration. And this brings, you, this brings us also to the discussion of, 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 uh, of whether we should uh, be focused only on sites that have a high factibility on ecological terms because I believe that sometimes we should address sites that do not have this uh, high ecological factibility uh, uh, based on uh, social considerations, no poverty and, and conditions of living of the people in some areas that are like more difficult. Well, uh, now, the conclusions of these works, uh, from the work of Mendes Toribio et al., they, uh, they said that future projects would benefit from planification, uh, considering these priority zones, then by cost-benefit analysis, economic uncertainty, knowledge of establishment and monitoring costs, which uh, there is not much work on it in Mexico, to develop integral and participative monitoring plans to make a better uh, divulgation, or I don't know if that word exists in English, but to, to, to let know the results more broadly. And then to plan restoration actions in the context of climate change, which is not uh, very common in Mexico. Then I added some other considerations that are mine, mainly. Um, from some researchers that have been worked together. I think that something we should do is to identify social contexts that are conducive to successful eco ecological restoration projects. Because uh, I think that uh, this is really important. We should be able to identify main socioeconomic barriers to ecological restoration projects and to develop mechanisms or uh, strategies that could help us to overcome them. In my opinion, social problems are by large a stronger 
barrier to ecological restoration than ecological aspects. And these barriers may arise from inside a community. This is the first level. Who has the representation? Who has the power? Who has the decision making? Who has the ability to do or the capacity to do decision making? As we all know, economic and political power are usually interlinked. And this creates different groups in communities with different power. And in order to include all, it, it's really difficult, you know? Uh, then uh, the next level would be among communities. In Mexico, there, is a pro there are problems of land tenure, uh, communities fighting for a piece of land usually, or their right to use them. They have different funding from governments or from uh, local governments or uh, state governments. They have different political economical power and some communities can impose some rules to other more poor communities that depend on them. For example, the water they give them or that kind of stuff, or the roads and that. And then the regional relationships among communities, government agencies, NGOs, enterprises, and economic sectors. So this makes, for me, this means that landscape restoration will be more difficult to achieve than it is usually recognized. We, it's now on, <laughs> it's now very fashion to talk a lot to talk about landscape restoration, but these kind of problems are seldom addressed with, with all the importance they have. I think this is in Mexico and in other countries. And on top of this, we have the national level problems, which are related to lack of coordinated public policies of environmental protection, restoration, and production. So here I... Um, I have uh, the agencies that, are, uh, that have something to do with conservation and restoration in Mexico, which is CONAFOR, the Forestry Commission, then the, the Minister of, uh, of Environment and Natural Resources, the, the Commission of Natural uh, Protected Areas, CONAVIO, and this Commission of Water, which is usually only, which usually only cares about tubes, and water, and they don't, they don't care about ecosystem conservation or restoration. And then uh, on top of them, you have uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and many other, uh, um, many other agencies that have much more power than the environmental sector. So we have gaps in, and contradictions in our legislation. We don't have a national restoration plan, and we should work towards having it. There is a low relative weight of academia in decision making in government agencies, like the one I have shown you. There is low budget and low political weight of environmental government institutions. There is a proliferation of NGOs with varying interests, political and economic weight, and we don't always know what, what they are really aimed at. There is also lack, as I have told you, lack of private sector involvement in large restoration projects. The, the companies, what they do is what has been called green masks. They, they paint their face in green, but they really don't do anything. Like here I show you this from the web page of Coca-Cola. They say they are taking care of the environment and they're paying for reforestation programs. But if you go, it's usually just for the TV or for the, or for the photo, but when you go two years later to see what happened in that place that they, that they planted, it, 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 they didn't do any follow up and there is nothing there. So we call this, the, the, the Minister of Environment uh, coined this term uh, uh, green mask and I hope the, they will start to, to, to disappear. 
Well, I think uh, no. we have another one of Mexico in which I review the graduate studies. At my university, UNAM, which is the, the largest one in Mexico, we have graduate studies in, in, in biological sciences or sustainability, and where we have uh, students mostly making master thesis in restoration. The last one, the master in sustainability in the area of environmental uh, restoration started in 2015 and uh, has had 36 students, but this is not all because before there was a master study in ecological restoration. So we do have some time uh, forming the students, not very many of them. Now the two more recent ones is the, this in the southeast, uh, in Campeche. There is a master in ecological restoration, which started in 2012, had 61 students. And the newest one in the north, in the University of Nuevo León, which started in two, two years ago and has only had five students. But besides these formal graduate studies, we have this, uh, this diplomado, which we call in Spanish, who, who would be like a one-year training online, uh, which is, uh, this is, uh, I think, PIRE, and this is in Ecole, it's an institute in, in Veracruz, in Jalapa. It started in, in five years ago. It has had 2,023 students from 17 countries. And in this year, they have 66 students. So I think this is a, this is a flourishing or a, or a good uh, program that, that has had some exit. Well, I want to tell you finally that unfortunately there is not a good organization of restoration professionals in Mexico. We don't have a web of restoration, we don't, we don't have a society of people working on restoration. There was only a first national symposium that was held in 2014, but uh, no permanent organization followed it and no other national reunion has taken place. We are not really well organized. I, my personal opinion is that uh, competition is, is greater than <laughs> union. In, in the professionals of restoration in Mexico. Uh, well, then we have ended up with Mexico and we'll go to the next country, which is Brazil. I will talk briefly about Brazil, about the, this huge restoration problem, which is called Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact because it is very popular and almost everyone in the restoration community has heard of it. So this map is the, uh, the green is the forest remnant of Mata Atlantica. The red one is the potential, potential area for restoration. And then the lighter color is the original distribution of this vegetation. So it is a huge uh, initiative, uh, this, bi this biome, you say biome, I hope so, uh, goes across 17 Brazilian states. It's a coalition of 260 stakeholders that includes government agencies, private sectors, NGOs, and research institutions. It's multi-institutional, multi-partnered, bottom-up initiative which aggregates ideas and action to achieve large-scale restoration. It is aimed at restoring 15 million hectares by 200 and, 250. It has a set of governance tools so multiple actors can implement key processes to achieve long-term restoration goals. Uh, in Brazil, it is mandatory by law to protect lands around its rivers and ponds. So here, 
you see this photo of this uh, vegetation going along the a stream in the state of Pará in North Brazil, which is an example of restoration pro project that was given to me by Ricardo Rodriguez from the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, this is an example, and we can see the, some characteristic of this uh, Atlantic Forest uh, Initiative, which was launched in 2009 in three steps, engaging uh, diverse restoration stakeholders to join the coalition, looking for uh, diversity and improving credibility and impact. Then to de they develop material and deliver them to the members. Uh, they have books of lessons, restoration methodo methodologies and techniques, guides, maps of potential areas, and very important, they have a, a website to register online. And as I already told you, they had uh, a target for the area to be restored. Uh, I believe that the key to the success of this program is the legal framework they have. And uh, they, according to the forest code, 25% of the area of each property must be conserved or restored. There is a program of rural land registry, which is called PARA, Environmental Registration Program, in which everyone should be registered. Now, if you as a landowner have a deficit of, of, of forest, the, a project is created. And the owner frames a contract on environmental engagement that includes compromises per period and monitoring. So this is very important. They, they are monitored uh, to see that they accomplish the goal they, they, they had with this uh, contract. If a, an owner has a super habit, uh, he or she may transform the forest or may choose environmental serving. That means he will get paid from some, other per, from some other person for keeping that forest. So this is what has made this project very, uh, very successful. Uh, in here you can see uh, these colors are the deficits. So the areas that have a large deficits are the one on red and, and orange around here. No? And the green ones is where they have almost no deficits. Uh, some colors like this down here are uh, indigenous territories that are for conservation. Well, according to Ricardo Rodriguez from this laboratory of ecological and restoration forestry, they, they have this uh, program and I believe that the key is that uh, they work both on environmental and productive uh, projects. They start, uh, the environmental part has three phases. The first one is an evaluation of the state, which, uh, which uh, is a diagnosis uh, made from aerial images and field work. And uh, based on that, they, they settle the uh, ecological restoration zones. After that, they, they give a, a set of restoration methods. Uh, they have uh, in the Brazilian legislation, riparian zones must be protected, must have a, must have a forest around them, and they, they also have this legal reserve. Both of them uh, conform the private forest research. The action three is to, to, to deliver a technical training for the landowner and his employees. Uh, so they train them how to do it. But besides doing that, which is which, uh, what we usually do, they pay attention to the agricultural uh, aspect. They they, they have developed technological packages for, uh, for areas with high agricultural aptitude, so the, 
the owner, the landowner knows that he can improve his production and that's very important. Then they propose alternative uses in areas having low agricultural aptitude. So I think this is very, very, very good. Really. Here is an example of a facenda, a hacienda, which we say in Spanish, a, pro a private property with a difference of five years. Here are the roads, and as you can see, all this area by this road and down here is now covered by forest. We have a pond here. And you can see that uh, it, it's been very successful. There are many examples like this. Well, the accomplishments of this, uh, of this program is that they have restored in five years around 700,000 hectares of native forests, and they expect to have 1.5 million hectares in next year. And they relate their success to three main activities. One is development of restoration governance, communication, and articulation. Two, promotion of strategies to influence public policies, public policies. And three, establishment of restoration monitoring systems. The problems they face is that there is a, an overrepresentation of NGOs and only recently academy investors and governments are, are increasing. There is an uneven geographical distribution of the members. Well, most academic members and also, I mean, I imagine that uh, uh, government institutions and enterprises are in around Sao Paulo in the south. They think it's necessary to increase the number of private companies to, <coughs> to design incentives to increase the, le the level of compliance with the forest code, to create new markets for timber and non-timber forest products, to promote payment for ecosystem services, and develop more cost-effective approaches to forest restoration. However, however with all these pro problems, overall, this is I believe the most successful large scale restoration program in Latin America. But Brazil is almost a, <coughs> a continent. And there is more than the Mata Atlantica in Brazil. I try to search for some other kind of ecosystem. And <coughs> I got these uh, examples from the Terrado vegetation, which is uh, uh, this uh, vegetation has been recovering by natural regeneration after pasture and forestry in the area after pasture and forestry in the areas re required by law. I mean, 25% of the, of, the, of, the, of the area should be restored. And although not all, not all of it has been restored, it has recovered naturally. Now this uh, researcher, Gisela Durigan, from uh, this, who works in this uh, ecological station that's called Assis State Forest, have replaced around 800 hectares of pine and eucalypt plantations by grassland cerrado vegetation. So here we can see the pines that, that were originally there. They use fire, they use native grasses, introduce native grasses, and two years after they have a very nice result. Unfortunately, this, this, these areas have not been properly quantified, but I thank Giselda for the photos. And in relation to organization, in Brazil, they have uh, many programs on education. These uh, authors analyzed 272 <laughs> graduate programs, which is a lot. <laughs> I think we don't have as many in Mexico. 25% of them offered courses on ecological restoration. But again, most of them are in the southeast region of the country, where everything is uh, it's packed. 
they 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 see that regions that are not forest ecosystems are not well represented and what is very important for me social approaches were only considered in three percent of the courses so i think this is a, a huge uh, gap we have in brazil and in all latin america uh, this uh, lab of ricardo rodriguez has had one uh, 122 theses or postdoc researches in only one lab. So I think this is about as much as we have in all Mexico. <laughs> and they are very well organized. They have two societies, the uh, Brazilian Society of Ecological Restoration that uh, was originally a web or red of ecological restoration, which is SOMBRE, and Sobradi, which is the Brazilian Society for Recovery of Degraded Areas. So we have these two organizations in this huge country. Uh, then we will go to our third uh, country, which is Colombia. Well, th this is a map of the areas that need uh, to be restored in red. So here we have the Caribbean region of Colombia, and here in this long uh, are the Andes, the Andes, the Andes. So as you can see, more, there is a huge need of restoration in both areas, in, 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 the, in the Caribbean and in the Andes region. There is less need in the Amazonian region or this part with the Orinoco, which is close to Venezuela. So they, they have this uh, data of 82% of degradation in the Caribbean region and 61% in, in the Andes. Uh, but lately, there has been a lot of degradation in the Amazonian region. They have a national restoration plan since 212. And in this, this is, uh, this is uh, the first one, I believe, in Latin America. However, uh, a recent opinion of this National Restoration Plan is that the actions are still lacking coordination, the budget is low, and there is not a firm commitment of the government to, to implement this program. However, they already have it, and, and I think it's, this is an, an achievement. The other thing is that ecological restoration is part of the government plans at all levels of the territory, from the county to the state, to the region, to the federal level. Uh, ecological restoration is mandatory. So I think that's also a, a, big, a big achievement of, of Colombia. And there is a growing number of students, academics, and professionals in ecological restoration in this country. Uh, here, I, this is from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, the proportional areas of the different regions. As you see, this is Andes, and this is Caribbean. These are the hugest ones. But lately, the Amazonian region is growing. And as you see, in the Pacific or near in the Orinoco, near Venezuela, it, they are smaller. Uh, I will show you a photo of, the, of the, what's going on of, on the Amazonian region because uh, we had a, there was a, this Congress uh, last year in the Amazonian region, and I, I was lucky enough to go there. This is the usual landscape. Forests have been uh, changed to pastures for, for cattle grazing, but uh, there is very low productivity. You see lots of grasses and very few cows because it seems the productivity is very low. But deforestation has increased lately, in part as a result of the peace treaty. As many people in the guerrilla or contra insurgency forces are looking for a way of life. So they have moved there, they have uh, taken off the forest, and, 
and they think that cattle racing seems the easy way out, although there is low, very low productivity and uh, high deforestation. So this institute, Sinchi Institute, which is in Caquetá, Colombia, they took us to a field trip in the Congress, and here I show you the work they have been doing. This is a forest recovery in a stream, around the stream. And this is what you can see very clearly, but here is a line, and here is another fence, two fences. And in this area, they are convincing some uh, ranchers to to plant forests, forests with species that will give them some profit in the future. So they are planting trees, and in here, in here you can see this is the pasture and this is the area with the planting of the seedlings, three seedlings. And in here there is, this is a technician from the Sinchi Institute that showing, that is showing us his land. He said, well, I've been teaching this and promoting this, and I haven't done this in my own land, so he decided to do it in his own land. And you see here the lines of, of trees that they planted um, perhaps three years ago, which have grown a lot. So I think they have done a great job, although they, they have not been able to go beyond 500 hectares or something. They have no budget and they pay for the fences. The, the owner only puts labor uh, for these uh, plantations. Uh, here are the projects in Colombia. Most of them are uh, on uh, to recover ecological process like uh, water to to recover ecological process and biodiversity, to promote connectivity, and they have also worked a lot in, in, in getting rid of uh, invasive exotic species. Uh, in Mexico, most uh, projects include areas, small areas, uh, uh, smaller than a thousand hectares, which goes right here, all of these are uh, a thousand hectares or less, and most projects are undertaken by government agencies. We have this, uh, this is the Ministry of Environmental, this is national parks, uh, academic institutions, this is regional authorities, and all of these make 59% uh, of the project. Huh? I should hurry. Well, then most projects started uh, from 2003 and later they are well organized in a Colombian uh, red, uh, web of uh, the restoration, uh, which is called Red Grey, and they have a master in ecological restoration, which started this year, but they have a tradition of training in restoration ecology and uh, on publishing restoration ecology texts and manuals since, since many years ago. So they are very well organized and they have a congress every two years. Other countries in South America are also getting organized. This is uh, the, the Argentinian web, this is the Ch Chile, I don't know in English, the red from Chile. This is a congress uh, in, in Ecuador, they had last year, which we attended, which was very nice, and they also had a first symposium last uh, last year in Peru. The situation in Central America is not as good. There are very few research reports or academic papers in ecological restoration in Central America and stark presence of them in academic reunions, except perhaps for Costa Rica and Panama, but again, most researchers are not from the, the countries. They were there, but they are from the states or other countries. There is almost nothing from El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and Nicaragua. This year uh, was the fifth reunion of the Bond Challenge in, in La Habana, Cuba, and the many co commitments were made. Cuba has, uh, will, will restore manglars, Guatemala, uh, they, they are forming a corridor in the Caribbean islands, Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico, 
all these countries joined, that's what Uruguay joined the challenge. I was there and we went to this uh, nice place, which, which is the Sierra del Rosario Biosphere Reserve in Cuba. This protected area was restored since the 70s. Well, this reunion in Cuba was a very political one, but an interesting experience. Here you can see people from UECN planting trees. The usual thing that's done in a political <laughs> reunion. Well, to conclude, I would say that the establishment of guiding approaches for national restoration plans requires a special consideration in Latin America due to its high socioeconomic complexity. And there are broad differences among countries in land tenure, <coughs> democratic and environmental institutions, and income distribution. They also harbor culturally diverse populations. These uh, conclusions were, were made by Paula Meli and some other researchers. Mm, la, now I here are some considerations of mine also. To the question if there are technical aspects of restoration well developed in Latin America, Meli and Deb, they say yes, but they have not been properly assessed, the ecological, socio-ecological dimensions. I think that there is enough ecological and restoration research in some biomes, uh, in Mexico, in Brazil, in Chile and Mexico, but there are still large gaps in knowledge in many other ecosystems. The sharing of knowledge between academia, NGOs, and government institutions can be good or very low. Scientific knowledge is not always made available to practitioners, in part because this communication lacks recognition in academic evaluations in some countries, like mine. I, I won't get any, 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 they don't care if I, if I do this kind of work. Then incidents of academia in restoration government and private projects may be good to very limited, they don't usually give us Mm, give us time. Well, here are the guiding principles uh, that, that I think that should support re ecological restoration. Integrating biodiversity and ecosystem services in restoration, restoring human modi modified landscapes, especially by achieving more involvement of communities, to think on cost-benefit trade-offs, to assemble horizontal communication framework and to encourage national restoration programs in all countries and increase investment in restoration that's very much in need. One main challenge in Latin America is to create a common platform for communication that shares effectively lessons learned by different networks acting on ecosystem restoration that can offer guidelines for practitioners and policymakers. That's what we are trying to do in CIACRE. Uh, Unfortunately, we have problems that are related to very little money. A few, pay, few people pay in fares when there is not a Congress, and we don't have professional workers. We all do voluntary work in addition to our everyday work in universities and other institutions, and this work is seldom recognized as a valid academic result. But still, we are engaged in trying to, to push for this, and I end up by inviting you to our next Congress that will be held in July in Santa Marta, Colombia, along with the Congress of the Colombian Red of uh, Restoration Ecology. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Consuelo. That was an amazing presentation and really synthetic. Um, it was really fantastic. Congratulations. We do have some time for, we're right at the hour. Mm -hmm. um, so folks, if you need to leave, you can leave. But if you have questions, we can stick around and have a question and answer session. Before we go to questions, though, I do want to mention that we posted in the chat box a survey. It is a two-minute survey with just three questions and it allows you to give feedback on this, the current presentation, the seminar series, but also importantly, to help us plan the series 
for next year. So we hope to, by December, have all the talks in place for next year. If you would like to present on a topic yourself or if you'd like a topic presented, you can provide that feedback there. I also want to remind everyone, Brock said this at the beginning, but you can view all the past webinars on the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group page of uh, the IUCN CEM website. And um, I'm going to start my video so you guys can see me, sorry, um, as well as on YouTube. And then very briefly, the upcoming webinars we're excited to announce are in next month in October, we have a regional update from West Africa. In November, we have a technical guidance webinar on emerging issues in seed sourcing and native plant materials. And then importantly, in December, we're scheduled to have a global initiative discussion, and that's going to focus on strategic planning for the UN decade, as well as for events at the World Conservation Congress. There is going to be a social for uh, CEM members and ERTG members in South Africa. I'll be sending an email about that. It will be something informal, a lunch, or just a, you know hour get together somewhere close to the conference venue. And then the next big event is the World Conservation Congress, at least for IUCN, which is in France in June. And the thematic group has put in a proposal for a session and is also working with IUCN to coordinate a pavilion. And we are planning to coordinate some joint housing for members of our thematic group. So let Brock and I know if you're planning to attend. And we're especially interested in engaging young professionals because in our proposed session, we have young professionals who will be doing the facilitation. Okay, that's all my announcements. Let's go to question and answers. Let's see if I can I find the answering one. Okay. Let's see. Uh, uh, here we, I'll just start at the bottom and then I'll scroll up. Apologies. So the first one, funding is always important for me. Who is working in Nepal for ecological restoration projects and what are the potential funding agencies for ecosystem restoration? So that is a Nepal specific question and I, I certainly ha don't have information. Consuelo, any, any Communications with folks in Nepal? No, I haven't been in Nepal. <laughs> but I think the question brings up the point for a need to have a communications platform. Yeah. Yeah. Within CEM, we do have um, a large body of global experts, including from that region. And there may be individuals from Nepal within our thematic group. Brock, what do you have on that? Um, I'm pretty certain there are. Uh, we have such a large group, definitely from that region. Um, yeah. What I would say is go to the IUCN portal, go to our thematic group or just the CEM in general, and you can search by country and find the people in, in, in your region. So um, if you've never been to the IUCN portal, there's a ton of great information there, and I would check that out. Great, and we have a very diverse audience here with people from Jordan, um, so it's, it's nice um, to see that we captured an audience that's, who's interested in Latin America that's not just from that region. Well, I have a question. It's about the UN decade and the fact that we have now global attention and you know, a decade where the UN is promoting, advancing ecological restoration. Consuelo, in your summary slides, you mentioned some of the key things that we need to do. Do you have ideas for how groups like SIACRE, uh, because there's many of them around the globe, can engage in the UN decade? 
Well, um, it would be great to have like a like a call, you know, to to have a gathering or a, or a reunion. Uh, the thing is that we have some academic weight and some experience, but we don't not have much weight in the in the government institutions. Uh, nowadays, in in Mexico, there is a, an ecologist and a, a, a committed ecologist with conservation in the minister Ministry of uh, of uh, Environment. But I think that. Uh, some kind of call should be done for the academic and NGOs and environmental institutions in each country to join together to submit some kind of uh, of, uh, of uh, target or actions yeah. that will be developed. I think that in Mexico, I mean, this decade, we could, if we could join forces, we could. Uh, work on this national restoration plan by gathering all the information that's available and to design uh, this. Uh, there was already a, a, a meeting uh, trying to go to this uh, plan that was uh, made by World Resources Institute, but I think that uh, something much more broad, broader should be done uh, because they well, they have a small place here in, and and they cannot be the one that that uh, that launch this project. So I think we should we could make a, we could make a, by CERT, IACRA, and uh, all the national societies we could make a call for a commitment of governments and academic institutions to work on restoration uh, using this. Decade, that's mm -hmm. a, a yeah, those are great ideas, and it's making me think that we should try to convene a meeting yeah. to get leads from organizations, you know, CEM, SER, SEACRE together, yeah. and also as you're building the conference for July, I think having a strategic session on this, maybe a workshop where people could really discuss, could be very important. Yes, we could talk about it later. Yeah. And the question of the uh, hurricanes, well, yeah, there are, uh, hurricanes have had a huge impact in the, in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and also uh, recently in the Pacific area. Uh, I don't know, I don't think there are plans to recover or restore islands, but uh, uh, I think it will be mostly natural regeneration. And about the, the genetic, genetic diversity uh, question, there is little research on genetic diversity. There is, uh, there is conscience now that, uh, that it's something that should be addressed and it's gathering more attention, but I think there is not enough in order to, not enough data even to include it in a, in a plan, except broad guidelines, you know, to try to, to, to to have a sample of all the genetic diversity of populations and that kind of stuff. But I don't think uh, there is more, there is a lot of money to document uh, uh, and uh, use genetic diversity data up to now in our countries. I think it, 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 it will remain uh, as a broad uh, uh, that, that must be taken and, and research uh, has still to go on for several years. And there is not very much money for research now, so that's the situation. So. Consuelo, I think you're seeing questions in the chat that I'm, okay, here we go. 
Um, you got the hurricane question. Um, how is restoration being introduced in terms of targets in the CBD post-2020 global biodiversity framework? And how is articulated with the UN Decade of Restoration? Are there concrete proposals? And this is from Rosa. I don't think there are I don't think there are concrete proposals, and I think we should work on them. <laughs> yeah. Make them. Yeah. I can add a little bit of information on this because the ecosystem restoration thematic group has been working to strategize on these issues with SCR. And we are hosting a one day discussion event in advance of the SER conference on this topic. And then um, we have a uh, delegate interactive event planned as well as a knowledge cafe in order to ensure that we're promoting ecological restoration within the array of restorative activities that are being undertaken in these broad scale restoration initiatives and also to provide some guidance for balancing delivery between ecosystem goods and services and human well being and biodiversity conservation and ecological integrity. And uh, if anyone's motivated to um, be on the email chain that follows up after these events or see any of the documents or action items, please send me an email and I'll make sure to include you. I do think it's important to have SIACRE, other um, organizations thinking through um, their priority, their ideas about priority actions and then coming together as a global community. Yeah, I agree. All right. Okay. So I think, oh, all. wait. Let's see. Eva. Okay, that's no. Okay, thank you so much, Consuelo. That was such a fantastic presentation. I'm so happy that we have it included in our series and that people will be able to watch the video. And we really appreciate all of you who took the time to participate and ask questions and engage in the thematic group. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. I'm sorry it took so much time, but. Oh, no, it's perfect. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Consuelo.